While we're doing that, if you'll turn to the book of Job, and if you have your workbook entitled Troubles and Trials, Stumbling Blocks or Stepping Stones, um, you can turn to page 69, and it's chapter 10, Job the Great Sufferer. And this is actually, <clears throat> according to page 67, part two of this book. I don't know that I've ever reached a part two of any book, but I have, I have done it now. There's a possibility we could actually finish this, but I wouldn't get your hopes up. <laughs> All right, so we've been talking about the various kinds of troubles and trials that uh, the believer can experience. We've talked about chastisement. We've talked about the sufferings of Christ, and you can see how very different those two categories are from one another. We talked about the temptations of Satan and the testing of God. And you can see how completely different those two are also. We've talked about labor pains. We've talked about common trials. Um, and um, Kelly, is that camera pointed correctly? Because it looks like it's looking. All right. I just want to make sure I can see everybody. I can't see them with it all bent that direction. <clears throat> all right. But now we're going to talk about Job, the great sufferer. And what we're going to find out is that Job actually goes through every one of the ones we've, we've mentioned up to this point. He goes through them all. And, uh, <clears throat> and he goes through all of those and, he, and, and something more. We find that more towards the end. But um, probably the best thing to do is to do a little bit of reading here <clears throat> so that we can um, really see what the issues are. Job chapter 1. Uh, and I guess we'll just start at verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz <clears throat> whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God, and shunned evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and, and to drink with them. And it was when the days of their feasting were finished that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This did Job continually. All right. I mean, that gives you a pretty good picture of this man and what he's got. <clears throat> so while this scene is going on in the earth, there's another scene going on before the throne of God. See, we just think this is, this is what's happening. See. But Satan is about to appear before God, and a whole nother scenario will be working. And it doesn't matter what we're doing down here or what we think we're doing or what we think is the big deal or what we think is guiding everything. There are spiritual things, spiritual entities, God and Satan. And verse 6 begins to speak of that. 
Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, From where comest thou? Well, that's kind of weird. God goes, Where have you been? <laughs> Then Satan answered the Lord and, and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. So that's a little bit like a parent asking their kid where they've been. Oh, oh, nowhere, you know, just out and up and down, yeah, around, and just, you know, up and down. And, uh, <laughs> and won't give a straight answer. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? perfect and upright man, one who feareth God and shunneth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? All right, so here we go. Now we're going to get into it. We're going to get into Satan's viewpoint. And we're going to, th we're going to see that Satan thinks that he is goading, he is pushing God and hello testing a little louder <clears throat> it's right at my mouth and that he's you could say manipulating God and you know people do that people do that they manipulate God, they manipulate one another to get their way or to get or to or to push someone into something. And so he says, Doth God does Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land, but Put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. All right, we're not going to get into all of the, well, what is he doing in the presence of the Lord, and why are they hanging out and talking about stuff, and why didn't God belligerent toward him and why doesn't he beat him up <laughs> um, <clears throat> it looks like Satan is testing God or tempting God and it looks like he is at war with God and his people and he may be in his own mind But God is totally in control, and he's not freaked out, and he's not going, oh, no, you know, turns to Jesus and goes, the devil was up here a while ago. Where were you? <laughs> Something dumb, you know. He's, he knows exactly what he's doing, but here's the deal. God doesn't always show his hand like we do or like the devil does. You know, he doesn't always show his hand because he knows exactly what he's doing. And to be honest with you, nobody else knows unless you have the mind of Christ. I didn't say deep knowledge and whatever. I mean the, the mind of Christ at work in you. I don't mean the brain of Christ. I don't mean the thoughts of Christ. I mean the mind of Christ. And so, so Satan also says... <clears throat> Well, you've, you put a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side. And you've blessed him. So, so that's exactly what God has done up to this point with Job. He put a hedge around him. Okay. Now, has anybody ever heard somebody pray, Oh, Lord, I just pray a hedge of protection around them. Okay, well, sometimes God drops that hedge, you know. You pray it up and he drops it back, you know, because he's got a greater plan than just keeping us blessed. And besides, the whole issue here between God and Satan is Satan is saying, look, the only reason why Job serves you is because you bless him. 
because you bless him. And if you stop blessing him, or if you take away this hedge, um, then he will curse you to your face. I mean, it literally says that. He will curse you to your face. All right. And God is saying, this is my best man. You know, this is my best man right here. And Satan is saying, let me tell you something. I've been messing with your people a long time. And I'm here to let you know that once these people get in trouble or not what they want from you, when they want it from you, they turn on you. I've seen it over and over, generation after generation, many of your top people and everybody else, because deep down, they have their own agenda and they have their own plans and they have their own abilities and they have their idea of what they have God in their life for. <laughs> and it's my own plans, my own abilities, my own, you know, that's why I have God in my life. And if God starts messing with those things, you know, this is Satan still talking, <laughs> then guess what? They will literally, they won't just curse you. They will curse you to your face. Don't take my goodies. Don't take my goodies. Well, God, God goes ahead and drops the hedge. Now, you know, God has this thing called foreknowledge. Are you familiar with it? <laughs> that means he already knows what's going to happen. So, the way the book of Job should go, according to most Christians, is the devil comes in, messes with Job's goodies, and Job just blesses God and says, I, I'm going with you on this or anything else. And we'll see some of that, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a picture here. And that's the end of the book. But the vast majority of this book, I mean, this thing goes to 40-some-odd chapters. We get, in fact, at this point right here, we, we still got like 41 chapters to go. And most of it is not pretty. Um, and we'll get into the reasons why. All right. So he... Uh, he says, put forth now thine hand and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he hath is in your hand. Interesting wording. Satan says, you put forth your hand, and God says, okay, you're my hand. Yeah. I didn't write it. <laughs> I didn't write it. I just read it to you. Um, but that's interesting wording. Put forth now thine hand, and he says, okay, all that is in your hand to do, you do it. Hmm. It almost sounds like the devil is a tool of God, but we can't see him as a tool of God because when he shows up around us, he takes away our toys. That can't be the hand of God. See? But, but you see, we don't really, we don't really see what this is all about. We think that God put us on this planet, gave us free will, and we're some of the lucky ones that chose Jesus. And not only are we saved from hell, not only are we saved from the consequences of all the bad things that we've done, you can pass that up here when you get through, okay. Um, but we, we get to have goodies. Yeah, we get to have goodies. 
and they don't because they don't have God. That's kind of the, it's kind of the thought. Well, that that will be greatly developed within this book. All right. So <clears throat> the Lord says, "Okay, well, you can touch anything that He owns, but don't touch Him." All right. So verse thirteen. Here we go. Satan's going to touch Job or his things. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only uh, am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another, and he said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped to tell them. That's just like the devil, to make sure somebody lives to tell you the bad news. <laughs> you know what I mean? We go, oh, he's so merciful, he left one. No, the devil is not merciful. He's cruel and mean in his little ways. <clears throat> um while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans uh, made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and tore his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. Okay, this is gonna turn out good, right? This, this is going to turn out really good because now, soon as what the devil said would, would happen and soon as it is seen to not happen that way, the devil will quit. No. But the devil said he will curse you to your face, didn't he? Well, he didn't. He fell down and he worshipped. All right. And verse 21, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God with folly. You know, I've been at this for a while. Uh, been down the road on some of these things particularly. And what I have found in, in my own life is that in the early going, <clears throat> those scriptures were very um, edifying to me. And it made me want to honor the Lord when bad things came. But what I noticed that I did was I would say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord when it was something that wasn't on the high priority shelf. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The shelf of my high priorities, hopefully out of the reach of Satan. That's why it's high priorities, high shelf. Um, and... Any, it's, it's almost like, okay, anything down here, you know, it's kind of like going to a carnival and, you know, if you, <laughs> or, but it, anything down here on these shelves, these lower shelves, you can have, Satan. But I only have five items way up there. That's all. That's all I got. I got five items. And so... I want to, because I'm with the Lord, I want to encourage you to just take whatever you want down here on these lower shelves. <laughs> and he would, and there were times that he'd take something off the lower shelf and I would go, 
The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I cannot tell you how spiritual I felt. I mean, honestly, I cannot tell you. I mean, I, it's like, I'm so spiritual. I'm such a blessing to the kingdom of God. You know, um, because, you know, I made sure that the things that I wouldn't freak out over were within reach of the devil. But I tried to put high enough and hidden shoved to the back of the shelf so he couldn't see the things I really didn't want him to touch. All right, so I noticed, I noticed at times like that when he would take something off of those shelves that I would be, I would respond like Job and it would be so beautiful, so beautiful. But that rascal sometimes would sneak in and try to pull something off of the top shelf. The good news is the high priority goodies that I have up there, I guard very diligently. And when he grabbed it, I ran into the room and grabbed it too. Okay. And we started tugging and fighting and and I, there's no, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. It's, it, it's, it's more screaming and it's mine, that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but the funny thing is, is that God is not um, embarrassed about the way that we are. If we are serious about having Christ revealed in us as our life, then he's overjoyed to bring about whatever he has to in order to answer our prayers. Whatever it takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. Can I get amen? All right, so let's go on because Job's doing really good. Okay, so far, folks, he gets straight A's. Okay, now remember, we're not even out of the first chapter yet. <laughs> I mean, wait till you get to chapter three. You're going to love chapter three after this. <clears throat> let's go to chapter two. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From where comest thou? And Satan answered the same old garbage, trying to hide, you know. I'm sorry, that's my translation. This year just doesn't say that. Anyway, <laughs> verse, verse 3, the same old cover-up. Verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And servants, and Satan's going, I have. Are you inviting something here? You know, I really enjoyed that last one. <clears throat> that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, an upright man, one that feareth God and shunneth evil. And still, here God adds this, this and still he holdeth fast. Notice the next two words. What are they? His integrity all right now i've heard preach i've literally heard preachers preach and you know this is what it's all about you need to hold your integrity uh his integrity are going to be like well, i won't use my the example i'm thinking but it's not it's not going to stay up let's just put it like that <clears throat> um Hold us fast in his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. All right. These are interesting words. These are this last little bit. This is interesting where thou movest me. What is it? Thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. I can't tell you how many times I've seen in the scriptures, and I'm sure you've probably haven't noticed it too many times, if, all, if at all, how many times that God 
will say what you want him to say because he's testing you. And I could give you a bunch of examples, but we don't have time right now. <clears throat> but but this, is, this, this is important because we'll get back to this, at least the concept later on. Uh, and Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give up for his life. Okay, there you go. There you go. All right. You know, take up the cross, deny yourself of things and follow me and you'll get more people because they'll, they're willing to give up things. But Jesus didn't say, take up your cross, deny yourself of things. He said, deny yourself. Just off the hand, just a, just it just comes to my mind. Now, how do you deny yourself? Do you reach for that piece of pie or something, and then slap your own hand with the other hand and go, no, 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 no. Well, in reality, you just cheated yourself out of something because self still wants it. You haven't denied yourself. You've probably only made him worse where next time he'll find a way to go around the right hand, the slapping hand, you know what I mean? And uh, because denying yourself is not telling yourself no. Have you ever heard the phrase, just say no? You can say it for the rest of your life and it won't do any good. Maybe, it, you know. They say, just say no to drugs. Do you realize the same Adamic nature that causes you to reach for that, whatever it is, causes them to reach for their drugs? And it, it should warn you. It should say, just say no, but remember you're saying no to self, and that's the center and core of your motivation and being. So good luck. You know what I'm saying? That's the way the whole thing would read, but that's a little long. So they just cut it down and just say no. <clears throat> um, this, Satan understands this. He's the one who just said this. Do you realize that? Do you realize that that was Satan who said that? And he goes, look, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he's got to save himself. Have you ever heard the, the, the thought that uh, the survival instinct is the strongest instinct in man? Well, I think it's true, and I, I believe that's true not just to survive from dying or something like that, but to, how about the survival instinct with its intent to not only survive but prosper in its ways and things. <clears throat> All right, so how do, you, how, do you, how do you really say no to self? Well, there's only one way, and that's the cross. I mean, that's the only way. Um, but when you talk to people like this, like we've been talking so far, when you talk to people like this, People may smile <laughs> and go, yeah, that's right. Um, but in many of us, there is still a fear. That God is going to take away our goodies. All right. Well, how do you take the, away the fear of the self-life that self isn't going to get what self wants? Should I say that again? How do you take away the fear of the self-life that self isn't going to get what self wants? You don't. You can't take away the fear from the self-life. You can only take away the life of the self-life. Right? All right. So the answer is the cross, but when we say that, then we get fearful again. It's like, oh no, would you stop talking like this? <clears throat> All right. 
There is, there is no way to describe to you what is better than your goodies, your high priority goodies. There's no way to describe to you what that is. The Lord, the Lord knows that there are some who when confronted with that will have the same response but will continue to go after the Lord even maybe with fear mixed in. Well, that's, that's really the key because you don't automatically change. You change into the image of Christ. And the only way you're going to do that is to continue in the word. If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth. Which, which folks, I don't know if you know this, those scriptures are in John 8 and it says, um, and when Jesus said this, then many believed on his name. Okay, so remember we talked about the gospels and the goal was not, didn't seem to be to preach the gospel of salvation. Well, here, here you got Jesus and you got him saying stuff and many are believing on his name. And it says, then Jesus turned to those that believed. <laughs> okay, so he's got something to say to believers. How soon after believing does he have it to say? Immediately. <laughs> then it says, and after this, many believed on his name. Then Jesus turned to those who believed on him and said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I thought that's what believing was, was knowing the truth. No, believing is believing. Knowing is knowing. That's why throughout the scriptures you constantly, I mean, maybe you don't notice, but Paul is really strong on this. He, he'll say, know ye not that so-and-so saw, or know ye this, or know ye that. Um, one of my favorite ones in Corinthians is, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. You've heard my translation of that. It is, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Same words, just slightly different emphasis. <laughs> he is trying, there is, he's speaking to the brethren. They're saved. They have the Lord. They're bound for heaven. They're not going to hell. They're forgiven of their sins. Everything that the basic believer concludes is all you need to know and have. Paul refutes that. Jesus refutes that. And Jesus says, look, I'm glad you're believers. Now I want you to become knowers. If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth. Okay. You shall know the truth. And, you know, there are many places where Jesus said things and, the, and then their response, or at least the scripture says, but they understood not these things that he said. Ultimately, the goal of the Lord is not just to get us to know the things that he knows even. We believe, now I know the things he knows. We still haven't reached what he's trying to communicate. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We believe, so we go, okay, well, that's it. No, and so then we know, and we believe, and we also know, but ultimately, he wants, God wants, the one that knows this stuff to live in you. I mean, what is, what is, what's the alternative? Now think about it. What's the alternative? Well, let's see. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible and there's a lot of stuff to know and everything. So what God wants us to do is first believe and then become omniscient, which means all-knowing, knowing all of this stuff. 
He wants us all to become omniscient. And so that in any circumstance you get into, I know what that is. I remember studying that or I heard that in class. Let's do this and I will obey, you know. And, and we, we, you know, and we, every time we get in a circumstance, we, we're all knowing. But that's not God's solution. His solution is the one who knows all things to live in us. And instead of all coming by knowing, it will come by life. The life of Christ. The life of Christ. Now, I don't know how y'all feel about that. But I've been, I've been a long time in this reality of Christ in you. And to this day, I can't think of anything better than Jesus. Not just Jesus at the right hand of God, not just Jesus in the midst of us when we gathered, two or three gather together. You know, I think first of all, that scripture isn't just saying, well, if you get into a building and two or three gather together, then he's gonna be there. I think it's when two or three that are one, he is the one. I mean, do you understand the, my weird translation? But if two or three gather together as one, he's the one. But we're, we get a little spooky with it. Well, we just need one more and then he'll show up, you know, or something like that. You know what I mean? I mean, come on, is that really right thinking? I mean, we, I know we've, we've used it for years, but is that really right thinking, you know? I mean, thank God he said two or three. Uh, instead of three or four, because two would be going, well, what do we do? There's not, there's not another, you know, it's got to be three of us. It's got to be the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. <laughs> no, it's got to be one. You are his body. He's the life. You're gathered together in his name. We're the body of Christ. We're the vehicle of Christ. We're how he gets around. We're how he is reflected to this world. We're here, you know, and we are gathered as one to that end. And he is surely in the midst then. He is surely in the midst then. So what I was saying is that I, you know, I don't, I can't think of, and you know, you say, well, you're supposed to say that. You're a, you're a religious man. You're a religious icon. You have to say these things. No, I'm not. I just love Jesus. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm just an earthen vessel. I'm an earthen vessel. You know, it's a, you know, a dirt bag would be an earthen vessel, you know. <laughs> You know, I am the vehicle of Christ. It may not look pretty or it may not, you know, appear pretty. And, and you see that in the tabernacle in the wilderness when God said, I am going to dwell in your midst. And he meant right in the middle and in the heart of your life. He didn't say, I'll be with you and I'll walk around in the tents with you. You know what I mean? I mean you, you see what I'm saying? There was a tabernacle built that represented his habitation. And in there was the Holy of Holies and the very presence of God and the Shekinah glory and all of the holy instruments and everything. And, and you know, inside they had beautiful tapestries and things were made of gold and gold was wo woven into several of the, the veils that, the, that were represented represented doors. They were doors in which you went further and deeper into this thing. But when you were outside of it, the final layer over that temple in which he dwelt was badger skin. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you're familiar with badger skin, but it looks kind of like a skunk. <laughs> well, folks, what people see first is not God, they see badgers, they see us. And we're not so glorious, you know? 
so it's it's a good idea that we focus on having this treasure in earthen vessels, in badger skin people. You know? Bless you. Come out. <clears throat> so I got to be careful doing that. I was joking and did that once, and a person fell out on the floor. <laughs> no, it, it, during a church service. <laughs> well, the good news was they did get deliverance, and it was over with. But. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I was saying, you know, man, if, I, if it's the devil and he's messing with me, I'm like, get out in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I wasn't talking to you, dude. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> All right. I put my Bible down. That's a mistake. <clears throat> um, all right. Where were we? Chapter <clears throat> 2. All right. And we were ending there. Um, now we start at verse 5. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Okay, is this going to be strike two? And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the uh, sole of his feet unto his crown. That's funny. I think that's where the phrase, you know, Lord, heal them from the crown of their head, from the soles of their feet. But God sent boils on this guy from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. I don't know. My mind just, that's scriptural. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I, these things come to my mind and I say them, okay? But I, I we, we, we get so religious and if God really had his way, he'd probably smite us with boils more often. How much? From the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. All right. Verse 8, and he took a pot shirt with which to scrape himself, and he sat down among the ashes. All right. <clears throat> so here he is. He's lost everything, and now he is covered with boils all over, and he's sitting in the dust. And he's scraping himself with a broken piece of pottery. So, good news though, his wife is about to show up. <laughs> I know that she is going to encourage him. <laughs> I know that she will. Let's read, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? integrity? Curse God and die. Oh, man. That's, that's rough. You know, the only, the one person, you know, you think, you know, with God killing all these people, <laughs> why couldn't he, if she's going to be this way, why couldn't God just take her out too? You know, I don't need the, the extra agony at the moment. <clears throat> but this is all ordered of God. Nobody can get to you like your wife. Nobody can get to you like your husband ladies. All right, so verse 10, but he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? See how he says that? That Job said it just like that. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lip. I wonder if something else was going on on the inside. Have you ever seen that? Where somebody looked and spoke really like they were of God outwardly, but on the inside there was stuff going on. Have you ever seen that in the, in the mirror? <laughs> Anybody ever seen that in the mirror? <clears throat> well, You know, it only lasts for so long. You can only put up a front for so long, and then something's going to give somewhere. So uh, now we start moving into uh, 
we start moving into the real issues that are about to take place. Up to this point, remember we talked about outward afflictions and then the, and their contrast to inward afflictions? Anybody remember that? If you remember that, raise your hand. Thank you, three people. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder why, you know. <clears throat> I, I do what I do for the Lord. Well, I do, and I'm, uh, I'm pleased to do it. You know, I, here's the problem. See, you may think you're missing it all or you're not getting it because you do, don't even remember that section, but I believe that the word is spirit and life, and it seeds, and I believe it goes into your spirit, and I believe that you can sit there and go, Duh, I, don't, I didn't get anything. You know, and that does not, <laughs> that does not mean anything. Because clearly you do not know what's going on. But the Holy Spirit, oh man, the Holy Spirit, he loves lifting up Christ. And he said, you know, and it says, how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, we have to preach. We have to put the seeds in. But one man sows, one man waters, but. God gives the increase. You see that? And he does it in his timing. And I don't have expectations of timing. I don't go, well, I just taught it last week or two years ago or, you know, whatever. I, I don't know. I was, I was praying about it today. I was writing. The Lord was giving me some stuff, and I was writing it. And, and I said, Lord, may this minister to someone 100 years from now, you know, in other words, I don't, I, wanna, I don't wanna just think about my life, what I call my life. It's not my life, it's Christ's life. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and forever. And so good things happening in my life is not really what it's all about. It's not. Bad things may happen my whole life with the end that what I live for or you, the seeds of that will be sown into another generation and they will uh, receive and grow up. So I think that a lot of times we're so, far, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this. I'm the one who heard it from the Lord about the 2020 vision. That has to do with people in the future, right? Not just right now. But there's sort of the thought that, well, we will live till 2020. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's, there's that thing of, and we'll get to see the glory of God, you know. But what if you don't? Is it still worth it? Is it still the Lord? Is it still, I'm going to say it like this, is it still pleasurable? to let Christ live in you, to let the Spirit bring forth the living reality of Christ and you can bathe in the water of life, you know, and, oh, man, be refreshed. You know, you can have peace when so many don't have peace. I mean, real peace, you know what I'm saying? You can really be at peace even in the midst of all of that. And see, that's our story, isn't it? That's our story because uh, the... The devil was saying to God, Job only fears you because you bless him. You know, he only respects you. He only follows you because you bless him. But, you know, I mean, what are the things that we call the blessings of God? That's the question. You know, okay, well, I'm so blessed to feel the presence of the Lord. Yeah, but what about if you don't? What if he, what if he withdraws the feel? He doesn't, he will never leave you or forsake you. So he'll be there. But what if he withdraws the feelings of his presence? What are you going to do? I know what most people do. God left me. Why did he leave me? What's going on here? Have I sinned? Is it this? Is it that? It must have been whatever, you know, and they go through. I mean, it's all about their life, where they're at, where they've been, where they are right now, and what all this is going to lead to. 
And we have a life that's eternal. And it is not confined to my, you know, surroundings. I mean, you know, my, my actual movement of my life isn't that much day to day. <laughs> I mean, it's not that big a deal. I mean, I, sad to say the last three days I have almost not gotten out of my chair other than go to the bathroom for the last three days. Now, I have, a, I have got my newsletter done and I've da-da-da-da, but I spent my time with the Lord. But it's, I'm not, well, what are you doing for God? Well, nothing. I'm pretty much worthless. I'm a stump. I'm a stump for Jesus. Okay. But am I? Is that what God sees? You understand what I'm saying? And is and, and is, is his seeing confined to what I see? You know, and you know as well as I know that lives are touched through your life or my life all the time, and we don't know anything about it. I mean, I, I haven't told this in a while, and maybe only one time, but my wife and I were in... Um, um, what is the... Texas, the, the rib place, Roadhouse, Texas Roadhouse. We were in there, and we're waiting in line, and, boy, it was during a bad time in my life when everybody, I just didn't want to be seen in public, and everybody was, felt like they were out to get me. And, uh, and, you know, they probably weren't, but, you know, you feel that way. And you know what I'm saying. I mean, and so I'm standing in line going, oh, but don't run into anybody here, and sure enough, right next to me is a person that we were very close but he got influenced by somebody that just destroyed our relationship and so I just went oh god you know we said a few words and then pretty quickly they called our thing and we went off and as we're going off down the aisle we're walking along behind the, the waiter guy that's going to take us to our thing this guy jumps up out of his seat and he goes, are you Randy Nussbaum? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, Pastor Nussbaum, I can't tell you. You know, and he, 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 this guy, yeah, and this guy went way back. I don't even hardly remember the guy. You know, Deb didn't either. And if Deb doesn't, that's pretty bad because she remembers everybody. Anyway, and he's just going, man, you changed my life. I was on drugs and I had all this stuff, man. And I came to your church and you prayed for me and da-da-da-da. And, you know, and the things that God shared through you and all this kind of stuff. And, and I just want to tell you, he said, look, here's my kid. And I'm married and everything and my life has totally changed. And I just want you to know how much I think about you and love you and da-da-da-da. And I'm just, I'm almost like, what? Because I'm so numb from the other, you know. And... And, I, you know, I just thought, Lord, you're just something else, you know. You're just something else. But the truth is, I didn't, I, I couldn't, I would never be able to call up this guy's name or his face and, and you know, in my little room hold on to that and go, oh, Lord, I touched one person. I, I couldn't, I wouldn't remember. God touched him. I didn't, you know. But God is touching lives through you, through you. He's touching lives, and he's not telling you about it. He doesn't feel like he has to report back to you. <laughs> so I just want you to keep, you know, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep your trust in him. And, and when, things, when things are going good, praise him. But I tell you what, it's better when things are going bad and you can still praise him, and you still love him, you can still say, you know what, Lord, if you never, I mean, I said this once, when he did, Devil can testify to this, there was a, a, about a two year period there, or around about that, that he withdrew his presence from me, and it felt like God was gone. And I said, well, what I do know, I'm gonna hold on to. You've heard me say, never doubt in darkness what you've seen in light. You know, what I do know I'm going to hold on to. And I told the Lord, <laughs> I told the Lord at that time, Lord, if you never do another thing for me, you've done enough that should hold me for, for all eternity. That's what I told him. And uh, so he, he went for a couple of years there. <laughs> 
then all of a sudden, this breeze, just the Holy Spirit just blew in and everything went back to the way it was before. But I think maybe he got more glory out of those two years than he did out of everything before because I was pumped. Yeah, during those years. In the last, in those those two years, nothing to pump me up. It's just purity, old spirit to spirit. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, let's take a break and we'll come back. <laughs> 